welcome to today's event, the 10th in a series of debates hosted by the Foundation for Economic Education and sponsored by the Arthur N. Roop Foundation. My name is Jason Riddle. I'm the College Programs Manager here at FEE, and I'd like to welcome all the students here in the audience at Grand Rapids, as well as all of those watching this live streaming uh, debate from around the world. Today's discussion is based on the topic of immigration. Unfortunately, Jim Carafano from the Heritage Foundation was unable to make it today due to some last minute flight complications, but the show must go on. We're still gonna have a fun discussion um, with Dr. Ben Powell and moderated by Scott Bollier. Uh, Dr. Bollier, he is the director at Troy University's Center for Political Economy. So I'm gonna turn things over now to Dr. Bollier who will introduce Dr. Powell and explain how we're going to proceed this Great. morning. Thank you guys. Well, thank you, Jason, and thank you all for uh, tuning in and thank you to the audience who's here too. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here and to uh, trying to fill in for James a little bit. So the format is going to be Dr. Powell presents his point of view on immigration. Um, I will present a point of view that uh, perhaps is in the general ballpark of James's point of view, uh, and then we'll just go back and forth with a bit of discussion between us and then hopefully a lot of audience questions uh, as well. Before we get to that, uh, just a quick explanation of what uh, the specific resolution for this debate is. The question that we're trying to um, focus on is whether or not a free market in labor makes both the data population richer and reduces poverty worldwide. So we're going to really try to focus on the economics of this um, and a number of other things as well that come into the uh, immigration issue. Before we get to actual content, uh, it's a real great pleasure to introduce a friend um, and, uh, and one of the real stars uh, in the free enterprise movement, Benjamin Powell. Uh, ben is the director of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University and a visiting professor in the Rawls College of Business. He's the North American editor of the Review of Austrian Economics, past president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education, and a senior fellow with the Independent Institute. He earned his BS in economics and finance from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell and his MA and PhD in economics from George Mason University. He and I were classmates, so it's great to be on the stage with him. Uh, Professor Powell is the author of Out of Poverty, <clears throat> Sweatshops in the Global Economy, editor of Making Poor Nations Rich, which has a really great chapter on Botswana <laughs> by someone, um, and the author of more than 50 scholarly articles and policy studies. His primary fields of research are economic development, Austrian economics, and public choice. Dr. Powell's research findings have been reported in more than 100 popular press outlets, including the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. He has appeared on numerous radio and television shows, including CNN, MSNBC, Showtime, CNBC, and he was a regular guest commentator on Fox Business's Freedom Watch. Uh, his center at Texas Tech is one that uh, we all are really excited about and watching, and it's just really uh, wonderful to have him here uh, with us this morning. So welcome. All right. Thank you, Scotty. Um, <clears throat> I was very excited to be here today to debate in front of all of you and all of you out there, someone from Heritage on this very important issue. Uh, unfortunately, that's not happening now, but I get to kind of debate my old grad school buddy, Scott, so it's uh, a lot like what we did 14 years ago, just with, with less whiskey. Um, <laughs> So let me begin by defining what I'm going to defend here today of open borders for the United States and other wealthier countries. I'm doing it for today's purposes within the context of our existing nation states that we have. So by open borders, I don't have to necessarily mean that you can jump willy-nilly across the Rio Grande whenever you want. We have border checkpoints right now. I think open borders in this context simply means that we're not going to put quantitative restrictions on the number of immigrants coming from any country at any skill level from around the world. You can still have your known terrorist watch list, a list of known violent international criminals that at the checkpoints you can do your best to exclude, or for that matter, if someone has contagious diseases that you're worried about an epidemic or something. It just means no restrictions on immigration other than that, a free market in labor. As long as people can come here and support themselves or find somebody willing to support them, they should be free to do so. That is a radical position, uh, at least in the context of contemporary America, and for that matter, the rest of the wealthy nations in the world. Most of the people in America disagree with me on this. Perhaps many of you in the audience do. So let me start with something that's much less radical, at least less radical among economists, and that's the case for free trade. That's been well established since Adam Smith and based on uh, the theory of comparative advantage since the mid-19th century. And what that theory says is whoever can produce products at lowest cost should produce them, while somebody else produces different products at lowest cost, and then they swap. So everybody has a comparative advantage in something, 
And we should all specialize in that that we do best and trade with everybody else. And as a result, the economic pie is going to be bigger for everybody. There's more total wealth to go around. And we're all better off over the long run than this. Put into concrete terms, um, you could grow bananas in Alaska, but it would require a lot of energy and a lot of greenhouses. And they grow much more easily in Honduras. You should let them grow down in Honduras and send them up to Alaska. And you can grow, I suppose you could grow Alaskan stone crab in Honduras uh, if you created the right aquarium. But that would be a tremendously costly way to do that. Instead, let the Alaskans fish those and send them down to Honduras in exchange for bananas. And there'll be more crab and more bananas total to go around. Both parties are better off. Well, there's a problem with some goods and services. You can't ship them across borders like this. I can't outsource my lawn care to Mexico. An Indian call center cannot be the nanny for my child. These services have to be provided on site. But the case for trading these services based on comparative advantages is the exact same as it is for the goods that we can ship across borders. So restricting migrants from coming here who could do our lawn care, babysit our children, drive our cars, makes no more sense than restrictions stopping bananas from going to Alaska. It forces us to produce these services for ourselves inefficiently. We have inefficiently too little low-skill immigrant labor in the United States, and as a result, we are producing things like childcare and other services at too high a cost and could be better off if we let more of it in. And don't for a minute think that this means that we're somehow unjustly exploiting these workers by letting them come here and paying them less than what we could do for services now. These people who are coming here, a, a Mexican who leaves Mexico and comes to the United States, nothing else changes about him, just his location, will earn 150% of what he could have earned in Mexico. A Nigerian, 1,000%. They see their incomes explode. In fact, this is the way to get rid of extreme poverty in the poorer parts of the world. The relative poverty that they might be in near us is vastly better than that extreme poverty of where they are, which is why they'd come here in the first place. So how big would the gains to the world be if we adopted, or if we and other wealthy countries adopted a more open borders policy? Massive is the answer. Labor is our most valuable resource, and it's locked up in unproductive areas of the world where we can't make the best use of it. Economists have done many estimates of what freeing the market and labor would do for the world economy. Consensus is somewhere around doubling world income. $70 trillion. Every year would produce $70 trillion more in goods and services than we do now. The estimates vary, but from a low of about $50 trillion to a high of about a little over $100 trillion. These are just massive, massive numbers in terms of the increase in wealth. Uh, even if they're widely off, the numbers are still going to be huge. And it's because we have such pervasive restrictions on this labor, and the labor is so valuable when it can be put to good use. So what we'd be seeing, really, is a, what we see going on in India and China today, which is a massive rural to urban migration. And this would be just writ large around the world, with many of them relocating to the United States and other wealthy nations. As an upshot, it doesn't mean that it's bad news for those countries that it leaves behind. So there's little evidence that when immigrants leave a country, they impoverish the place that they're leaving. And in fact, remittances dominate in terms of fl flows to poorer countries compared to uh, foreign aid flows, and they're more effective. We'd see a big increase in remittances to those people. And I suspect, although there's less good evidence on this, that we'd also see more pressure on their governments to reform policy as they're losing their productive people to the richer countries around the world. So I think a response that many of you have in your mind is, well, that's all well and good for them, but what about us? Now remember, back to the free trade and comparative advantage, both parties benefit from this trade, and that's exactly what economists find when they study immigration too. So we can look at current levels of immigration, and economists all agree that it brings net benefits, net economic benefits to the United States. It's small as a, or as a, in relation to our overall economy, but positive. Even a guy, George Borjas, is probably the most prominent economist critical of greater immigration. He puts the number at around $40 billion per year that we get as the native-born population as a benefit of the immigrants being here. Other estimates might get you into the hundreds of billions, but they're still relatively modest as a percent of a $14 trillion economy. But there's a reason they're relatively modest. We massively restrict the number that can come in, and we relegate many of them to illegal status where they can't make the best use of their labor. If we allowed more in, the gains for the natives would be much larger. Some would fear that this destroys American jobs. There's absolutely no evidence for this. 
uh, what we have is a classic problem of the seen and the unseen that Bastiat talked about. When immigrants come in and perform services and you see Americans who used to do that service no longer employed, you say the immigrants stolen their jobs. But what we're not seeing is the many jobs that are created precisely because immigrants are here. Statistically, they're created, but you can't always identify one to one that's where it came from. But if it was true that if we added more people, we took away jobs on net, think of what the American labor force should look like right now. What should our unemployment rate be? We've more than doubled the size of the civilian labor force since the 1960s, yet there's no long-term increase in structural unemployment. What we did is we created more jobs when we got more workers because we have virtually limitless desires for goods and services. So what about the wages? Well, the wages or the wealth overall of Americans is going to go up, but there's some concern about whose wages will be affected. When economists study this, if they're going to find a negative effect, they have to look at low-skill Americans, namely high school dropouts. And there, the estimates vary from slightly positive effect, even on their wages, to at most negative 8%, that's a George Borjas estimate, from current levels of immigration coming into the United States. So it's a relatively modest wage decline. Oh, and it tends to be temporary. Over time, wages recover even for those least skilled. Um, but also keep in mind that those people, some of them own houses, some of them have a retirement fund, which means they're in part capitalist. Both of those things go up in value as you have greater inf uh, immigration. But either way, it's just a small segment of the U.S. labor market overall. Also, we have to keep in mind, we're consumers of these immigrant services. That's the major benefit that we get from them. There's no economic policy that we could adapt that would do more to increase overall world production or to reduce global poverty than opening our borders to poorer people who are trapped by accident of birth in countries where they can make, not make best use of their skills. The upshot is it'll make us wealthier, although not wildly, but a little bit better off by letting them come here too. This stuff that I've been talking about is fairly uncontroversial among most economists, although widely misconceived in the general public. If Jim was here or James was here, I expect what he would do is probably start giving, he'd probably tell me there's a difference between a human being and a banana, and that when you move a banana, it can't do anything else but get eaten, but when you move a human being, it brings a lot of baggage with it that can cause other problems and start listing other problems for you. My answer would be, well, we'll talk about some of those other problems and whether they're real problems in the first place. But even if you believe they are, we're talking about doubling world productivity. It has to be a pretty massive problem to swamp that. The question is, could you use some of that $70, billion, $70 trillion to fix whatever problems that he might mention? So with that, I'll turn it over to my neocon <laughs> friend, oh, Scott Bollier. Okay. <laughs> I cannot wait. I've had 10 minutes to prepare for this. Um, I'm not going to respond to anything Ben just said, because I'll do that uh, in the rebuttal. I'm just going to talk about the argument for open immigration broadly and say that it's too optimistic. It sounds a little too good to uh, be true. And also, if you think about, I mean, many of the economic arguments being made sound pretty good, but there are a few things that uh, we ought to think about, uh, particularly in the way that Ben framed the issue. We're talking about open immigration within the context of a nation state still. We're allowing people to move, and we might monitor them for the disease at the border. And I want to talk, um, as someone representing an alternative point of view, about what is the role of the nation state uh, in protecting our interests as citizens of a nation. Okay, one of them seems like um, there should be a premium to those of us who are here. Uh, and also get into uh, a couple of arguments that are very important uh, and maybe um, secondary effects of this idea that, yeah, sure, someone benefits if they can win the lottery and get into America. Yes, you're better off, unambiguously. This does follow from David Ricardo's arguments about free trade and comparative advantage. It's a win-win principle that we talked about the first, in my first lecture here, uh, the notion that both parties gain if you consensually exchange, engage in exchange. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of things that maybe actually are really big and maybe big enough uh, that it cuts into the doubling of world output. So here's, uh, here I go uh, talking about uh, why we shouldn't embrace uh, open immigration. Uh, one of the big ones in my mind is that Immigrants come here illegally. They um, generally don't contribute to the tax base. Often they're flying under the radar, okay? Even if we just allow them to come, there's a lot of evidence that their total contribution, 
okay their total contribution to the public is less than the resources that they consume from the public so immigrants tend to have more kids those kids go to our public schools it makes it more costly to service them in public schools because they're usually speaking a different language okay so sometimes you need conduits between English and Spanish or English and Chinese and this is very costly for our schools to be supporting this they use our roads they use our health care by the way in the hospitals um, there actually is a code that if someone shows up you treat them and ask questions later I think this is a really good thing okay we you know want to save people and immigrants can use that to their advantage to abuse the medical system as well so the the costs while there's benefits to immigration in the sense that um, they gain, producers gain, consumers gain, there's these falling prices and all kinds of uh, desirable effects from immigration, there's a huge public cost on us all. They're net takers from the system. So our taxes could very well end up going up by a lot. And I think one of the roles of the nation okay the, U the United States government is to protect us against that possible outcome so the economics of this aren't completely clear-cut there's this big spillover problem that I think needs to be addressed a few other things that I worry about when thinking about um, open immigration <clears throat> America is a great place okay it's I still live here I'm demonstrating with my feet that it's like the best place in the world to be. Uh, its foundations rest on some core principles of economic freedom, the rule of law, okay, the right to private property. People from other countries who come here are coming from places where those ideas are less respected. Corruption is something that is common, and they've learned how to operate in systems that are very corrupt. There's gray areas where you typically, if you got pulled over by a police officer, might say, okay, you got me. I was driving 90 in a 55. I deserve a ticket. They might get pulled over and say, psst, can I pay you some money to just keep going? So culturally, they're going to slowly erode, and police officers might begin taking rides. Culturally, they're going to erode what makes America great. The fact that we are kind of law-abiding citizens. The fact that we sometimes vote for policies that keep us one of the freest places in the world. So I'm a little worried about that, okay? And maybe America's so big that we can absorb a whole bunch of people, but if you extend the logic of this open immigration argument to some small countries, what's making a small country free right now could evaporate like that. Okay, so here's an example. I, I've gone to the Czech Republic several times. Czech Republic's a small country, wonderful country has a lot of culture that is distinctly Czech. If the Czechs just said, anyone come, anyone invest, anyone do anything in our country, it could quickly become mini Germany. And you would lose Czech beer. You would lose Czech music. You would lose all kinds of things that are amazing, okay? So culturally, this could be really kind of scary for us. And I'm an economist who actually tries to bring a lot of this stuff all into, this is just economics. So this cultural issue, if there are costs to be considered on the cultural dimension, then it's just a, a cost that should be accounted for in the immigration argument. Um, a couple others that I think are worth considering. The possible, yes, you can, you can monitor people at the border, but are they really in any way effective in what they're doing and monitoring right now our security? So you're going to have a lot more people coming, some of them with really bad intentions, and we're just you know, even <laughs> engaging in worse, more, um, you're, you're engaging in an embrace of, hey, we're, we, we can't simply handle the caseload. There's going to be more risk of terrorism. There's possibly going to be risks of drug lords coming into our country and putting more drugs into our schools. Yeah. Um, crime could go up in some places imagine what open borders would mean and not open borders like as, as Ben defined it not open borders just anyone anywhere imagine if Israel became very 
embracing of anyone can come. Think of what might happen in the Middle East if we just embraced that there. Okay, so this is a trickier argument than it's not just about costs and money. And yes, you could improve human lives, but it may come at a cost to us, Americans, like a really big cost. Wages in America, just to go back to economics for a second, wages in America have been stagnant since the 1970s. In fact, net worth has fallen by about $20,000 per household in the last five years. More competition, which is indeed what happens when you have more people come, isn't going to help us. Many of you are in your 20s. You've heard about just how weak the economy is for you. Ask yourselves, does immigration make you feel any more secure about your prospects? One final one. We have open immigration here in the United States. People are migrating out of California in droves. They're moving out of Illinois, which is a total basket case state, in droves. And there's no evidence to me that those states are actually getting it together and doing any better. People are leaving and taxes are going up in Illinois, okay? In California, they just keep on regulating and saying, this is actually closer to what the people remaining want, okay? So the ones who get frustrated with the regulation leave and everyone else there is like, yeah, we like all of this in your business regulation. So it's not clear to me that policies are going to improve. So I kind of worry about the people left behind. Who's gonna get out of Mexico? People with a little bit of mobility. Those who are left behind, it could be Illinois to like the 10th degree, like really scary in terms of what their lives might be like. So there's a lot of directions you can go in being against immigration. Um, I've tried to spell out a few of them, why we should at least act with much greater caution and conservatism, because that's what's made America great. All right, thank you, Scott. So I'll start with the wages part first. So just to be clear, they've done tons of work on this. You have to directly compete with the immigrant labor to have a, a negative effect on your wages. That's why it's limited to people without high school degrees in the United States who feel a negative wage effect, and it's fairly small. For the rest of us, immigrants are complements, not substitutes, so they don't push our wages down. They increase our purchasing power by giving us more goods and services at lower prices. The fiscal effect. There's tons of studies out there. If you're watching this online, Google you know, tax impact of immigrants. You're going to see tons of stuff. But there's tons of junk science out there. And most of the junk science on the fiscal impact of immigration counts up the fiscal cost now of a new immigrant or that immigrant's children when they come here. And that's all it does. In fact, Heritage published a study like this a couple years ago of the fiscal cost of amnesty. And what it, did, what it didn't do was account for the dynamic effects in our economy of having immigration. The Heritage study essentially said these immigrants have certain tax uh, servicing that they get, but there's no other effect of these immigrants in our economy. So if having the immigrant here increases production and makes a business more profitable, that business pays more in taxes. That has to be counted as part of the fiscal impact. Like any decent scholarly study looks at your economy-wide effects of immigration, and it does another thing too. It looks at taxes not just at a moment in time, but over an immigrant's life. If we just thought about this for a second and considered adding new people to our economy, birthing them, all are net tax drains when they're birthed, and probably for 18 to, well, in some cases, probably 26 years, maybe longer. That looks really bad if you just look at the upfront taxes. Instead, you have to look at the taxes over their lifetime. And once you start doing that, the scholarly studies that basically look at the dynamic effect throughout your economy and account for the life cycle of being a net tax consumer at the beginning, a tax producer in the middle, a tax consumer at the end, what they find, it varies. Some are slightly positive, some are slightly negative, but they're all small, they're all clustered around zero. Basically, fiscal reasons aren't a real thing, uh, aren't a real reason to have a concern about immigration. You can find individual school districts or hospitals that are burdened, definitely true, but when we look at the macro all around, it's just not there. And even if it were, we control fiscal policy. If we're doing something that could double world income, could we change our fiscal policy to reallocate some of that to make it a win? In fact, the first point Scott brought up of America as a nation, shouldn't we get a premium for being here? Shouldn't America just be looking out to maximize for us? If your answer to that is yes, you should definitely increase, uh, uh, support increased immigration. Because if it makes the overall pie bigger, you could use things, and I don't per personally advocate this, but you could redistribute some of that pie to native-born Americans. If immigrants from Nigeria are gonna see their income go up by 1,000% by coming here, you could tax them 
on 999% of that increase, and it would still be a good deal for them to come here, and then reallocate that to native-born Americans, perhaps the low-skill workers who directly compete with them, and would still have more left over for both parties. I don't particularly favor that, but if that's your concern, fiscal policy is within your hands. And if it's just them draining on the welfare state or something, as my friend and colleague Alex uh, Narasta said one time, build a wall around the welfare state, not a wall around the country. I think the freedom and corruption one is the best objection, and this is the one I've spent the most time thinking about uh, for more open immigration, because the gains from trade are static. It's a one-time jump out in your standard of living. It's not about your annual growth rate. And our underlying institutions, private property, economic freedom, rule of law, that's what gives us, that's the kind of underlying fundamental cause of long-term development. If immigrants came in and distorted that rule of law, economic freedom, property rights respect, and it took down our long-term growth rate, that could easily make up for the giant gains that you'd get in a one-shot move. But I don't think there's very good evidence for it. Most immigrants who come here are fleeing bad places, coming to America because they want to be in a place where they can be more productive. They don't run away from Cuba and say, I want Cuba's institutions in the United States. That's a bit weird. Um, so actually, I've done some real recent work people want to find, actually I think it's on uh, Cato's website as a working paper with Alex Narasta um, and a few other colleagues. It, what we did is we looked at immigrant stocks and flows, not just in the United States, but in countries, all, actually all countries for which we could get data from 1990 to present. And we looked at the Economic Freedom of the World Index, which is our best empirical measure of uh, respect for property rights and economic freedoms that we have. And we said, does the, a high immigrant stock or a high immigrant flow over this time period impact the economic freedom? What we found was yes, but only slightly, and it's slightly in the positive direction. Countries that had a higher stock of immigrants 20 years later had a little bit higher economic freedom, and countries that had a bigger flow over that 20-year period had a little bit higher economic freedom. And I think one reason is, and there's been other work done on this, is the reaction to immigrants by native-born. People don't like subsidizing people who don't look like themselves, so they end up voting to contract the welfare state when there's more of the immigrants coming in. Uh, I think border security, they do a bad job of it now, they do a bad job under that, but if people want to get in, the government's not going to have any harder time under that new regime than what they do now. But uh, I think that was some of the main ones that you guys. I think the freedom one's the, the most important fundamental one of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm seeing movement. I'm not sure if we're going to questions now or if you want further rebuttal from me. Okay, questions now for anyone interested in, uh, in continuing. As you all get ready with your questions, one thing I think that's also worth bringing up in Ben's rebuttal just a moment ago is this argument that um, these are complementary goods. Immigrants are complements to uh, what you currently see. Technology is a complement to labor as well. And if you look at Tyler Cowen's work, um, isn't it the case that technology interacting with labor is actually leading to this massive divergence where you have about 15% of people doing really well, 85% basically living uh, kind of on a flat line level of income. Their well-being will get better because of technological advance, but inequality is going to explode under your But their absolute your standard proposal. still went out. The wage stagnation stuff is just BS because we know that wages are a horrible way to measure the standard of living because mm -hmm. their benefits have gone up during this time. But when I look around and people in, quote, poverty in the United States have a smartphone, technology has been making their standard of living higher, even if we don't measure it in their no wages. Questions? Yes. Um, I guess my question is, the question posed was, um, if every developed country opens their borders, um, what would happen if one or just some open their borders? Um, would they be at a disadvantage, advantage, um, or so on? I think it would still be, it wouldn't be as economically advantaged as the whole world opening up, uh, but it would still bring, bring net gains both to the immigrants who come and the country who receives them. I think some of your cultural problems would get worse, and as Scott points out, for some small countries, that's going to be a greater challenge, especially if they're the only one in the world that have that. A country as large as the United States, I'm not particularly worried about it. There's been various estimates of this, too, of how many people would actually come. There's actually a global survey of how many people want to live outside of their country of birth. And I think the uh, United States, I think it's about 600 million total who want to move right now, and the United States population would roughly double in uh, a sh fairly short time frame. But it doesn't happen, by the way, overnight, because the way the diasporas work is like a few people come, then spread word back, and a few more come, and it like, builds over time. Initially, our flow would predominantly be from Latin America. Although, by the way, the net migration from Mexico 
has basically stopped right now, and that's largely for economic and demographic reasons, not border enforcement reasons. Since the recession, Mexico's uh, economic growth compared to the United States has improved. That's taken away some of the pressure, but basically their fertility rates now are back down towards what U.S. levels are. Uh, so that gets rid of the big reason that so many people were coming. All countries, but all of our times during the 19th century where we had open immigration and we got a big surge, it was from countries going through this fertility change. Basically where sanitation and healthcare improve enough that more of your children live, but yet people still have children at the rate that they used to when lots of children died. You get a population bomb, a lot of them migrate, but then as people get used to the fact that children aren't dying, fertility rates fall. That was the natural cycle of our 19th century immigration uh, waves that we had. Mexico's just hit that one. Go ahead. Okay, so um, Scott said that the greatest thing about America is that it's full of law-abiding citizens. Um, I think really that the greatest thing about America is the diversity. Um, nobody in this room would be here if immigrants hadn't come to this country. Um, and it happened for hundreds and hundreds of years completely uncontrolled. So I suppose my question is why was it okay for hundreds of years but not now? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it gets hard, being so, over in this chair. <laughs> I'm, I'm sympathetic to uh, your argument. I, I, I think that one thing that, one tension throughout the history of American immigration has been um, that indeed it's a benefit, but there's just a tremendous amount of change and um, complexity that comes with it. If you look at the great wave of immigration in the late 1880s until about World War I, it's what I would call, uh, as an economist, a, a really good thing, a, a huge engine for productivity in the United States, but it has these deeply unsettling aspects to it that create a lot of anxiety, and um, maybe it should have been pursued more cautiously. Disease ramped up during that period, you had people living in Manhattan slums. Um, it's it's just not as, yes, we are all here because of immigration, but just allowing a massive wave in may not be the best way to do it. Maybe we need to manage it more carefully, have some just high-skilled immigrants come. It, to, to follow up on that, I think actually part of the answer, too, would be the, the argument would be twofold. Part, we didn't have a welfare state then. Mm -hmm. We assimilated them better then. Right. And um, technology has changed now, so travel's cheaper and word spreads faster, so it would be a bigger wave than what we had before, I guess would be the kind of three that I'd think about. I'd say the evidence on assimilation, though, is, and Jake Vigdor's done really good work at that, he's an economist from Duke, uh, in terms of English language, intermarrying, things like that, the late 19th century immigrants and immigrants over the last 20 years look a lot alike. And more recent immigrants actually are assimilating faster in terms of language ability, which also makes sense. We're in a more globalized world now. They know more about America before they ever leave to come here. Um, so I think the case is as, as strong as ever. And I think the relationship between welfare state and immigration is no accident that the U.S. got most of its big welfare state in the period where we had the most restriction on immigration. Uh, Dr. Powell, in your rebuttal, you didn't have time to address this idea of losing cultural heritage. And I was wondering if nations, so with the example of the Czech Republic, um, nations that depend on tourism as part of their economy, would cultural degradation, would that cause an economic loss in the long run? I don't, what you can't get is a net economic loss out of this. Uh, that could, so there are costs and benefits, so when you trade with foreign goods across borders, industries contract in one country, uh, country grow in another and you switch what you're doing. The tourist industry may contract uh, because people but think about what this means, too, though. Should we lock the world into these little cultural baskets so like us wealthy first worlders can jump around a plane and go visit places like it's the zoo? Or should we allow people the freedom to move around, intermix, and improve their lives? And if they all choose things because there's something in human nature that makes us all look more alike, I'd say that's cultural flourishing with freedom and just getting rid of little pockets that those people didn't deem best to hold on to. And I'd say just real briefly that we need to be careful. You could make mistakes uh, that are irreversible in embracing waves of tourism and all of a sudden you lose elephants and you lose this nice old way of doing I'm things. I'm not talking <laughs> about free migration for elephants. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what could happen to something that was historically really special if you just have hotel after hotel just outside of the touristy area. You can vote with your dollars on these things. 
but you can't go back to the way it was before. I've seen plenty of buildings restored. All right, uh, this is a question for both of you. Uh, regarding the, you know, the uh, debate of you know, open immigration or, or you know, having restrictions, uh, the argument that you know, moving to an open border system would create a, you, know, you could touch on culture if you want, but primarily economic shock, um, you know, either, you know, positive or negative. What is your opinion? And do you think that that's a strong enough argument to institute a gradual transition from one policy to the other, or just to flip a switch and have it happen overnight? I think even flipping a switch, you're going to have bottleneck, bottleneck, so it's not going to be institution. You have diaspora dynamics, which is why we draw from Latin America more first and Asia more first. Probably not very much from Africa, at least for the United States to begin with. Um, but if you're concerned, so when I think about the, like the shop cost, you've got a bunch of Americans who are used to a particular mode of production, so particularly low-skill Americans who provide services that would compete with immigrants. If that's really your concern, there's a better solution than restricting immigration or only phasing it in slowly, charge every immigrant an extra 10% on their income taxes. They're still way ahead compared to if they were trapped in the poverty in their home country. Use that money and give it to the newly unemployed, low-skill Americans to complete their education to do whatever. Um, and if you don't like 10%, make it 20%. There's lots of room to grow here when we're talking about doubling world income. Yeah, as, uh, as the token, um, critic on this, I have no answer. You've been doing good being a neocon, huh? Uh, Dr. Powell, so if you think this is a net gain for society and the world, uh, how do you propose creating political change so, you know, politicians would want to favor this and create this legislation to allow this? No, it's not happening. Well, how could you change it? That's what, how could you create the political change? I, I think uh, politicians are just trying to guess what public sentiment is. I think public sentiment doesn't understand the economics of immigration and has a general skepticism of foreigners, whether trade in goods and services or in migration. Uh, perhaps that it's an evolved skepticism from when we didn't have gains from trade over large areas and people who didn't look like you were dangerous. Um, Given that, I think it's a huge obstacle to overcome. I think what we need to do is make people better understand how it works, and uh, politics would follow from there, but I don't think there's a political solution. Dr. Bollier, you yes, mentioned uh, the risk of, the greater risk of terrorism, mm -hmm. and my question is if the U.S. government were to um, take resources that it's using to try to regulate the labor market, would they be able to better protect the national security? Sure. I mean, if the United States could focus on what it really should be doing, uh, which is, you know, basically protecting, if there is a, an important role for the United States protecting um, each other, uh, protecting individuals um, from each other and from other outside entities as well, you could, I mean, if you could um, deregulate and, you know, cut spending elsewhere, you would be able to assure security more. I think that the immigration position that if we could have greater integration that suddenly a lot of these things are just going to magically take care of themselves is one that's a little naive. Uh, leading into World War I, we were as integrated as we ever have been, at least in Europe, until maybe the recent moment with EU integration, and it was no defense against complete annihilation and two world wars, essentially. Yes, my question is with a country with failing states like ours, do we have the infrastructure to hold all these immigrants and just maintain order? I'm sorry, with failing states like ours? Yeah, with a, like a California where there's these mass exodus. Oh, um, I mean, productivity increases some, because we inefficiently provide some goods to the government today, some of those might be stressed and put pressure on for, for more reform. Immigration is not going to solve all of our problems. I don't think poor infrastructure in California, though, undermines the gains that immigrants can bring. Got nothing. As, I mean, my most, in terms of thinking about their impact on a public good provision in the United States, if it's truly a, a public good, it's, it's non-rival, which means when you add more taxpayers to the basic, it's cheaper per taxpayer. The problem is government provides tons of things that don't fit that definition. We are going to move to uh, closing remarks. Mine's going to be very short, and then we're going to give uh, Ben the last word. So I think that the message from those who are
concerned about just embracing more open immigration is that the process should be somewhat cautious it should be controlled we might want to keep an eye on the quality of immigrant we're bringing in and just go slowly and see what kinds of unintended consequences pop up each step that we take down the immigration path uh, I think that the notion that all of this is going to be clean and work just really well and it, it you know the bottom line is is that the gains are going to offset all of these things while it may be true those who stand to lose or be hurt in some way from immigration um, it's really going to hurt and there's no like true buyout that occurs when someone is dis <laughs> disserviced by immigration so it could breed a lot of hostility um, and be somewhat counterproductive to the broader open immigration cause so um, I you know I, I think the, the message is there are a lot of reasons to just be skeptical and to go slow at, mo at most. There's no claim that this would, not, that this would be smooth uh, and have no complications and no adjustment costs and people wouldn't have adjust. Any economic shift of magnitude that doubles world GDP is obviously going to have dislocation effects and transition costs. But we're still doubling it. That's a massive increase in wealth. So economics is a science of means and ends, and what it says is the, free case, the, trade, the case for free trade and labor is no different than the case for free trade in goods and services. It would lead to a massive increase in wealth. We should be concerned in making sure that they don't undermine our political institutions that give us economic freedom and the ability to have good long-run long growth, but there's not good evidence for that yet. If I don't see good evidence for that, that tells me this is a massive increase in wealth that can deal with these other problems. So, Economics is a science of means and ends. It tells you it's going to massively increase productivity. That doesn't tell you whether it's good or bad. We need uh, uh, moral theories to do that. So let's consult some of the, the, the major ones here and see how this fits in. Utilitarian case for open borders. Clean cut, massive increase in utility for people in the poorer parts of the world m moving here that's going to, uh, compared to the extreme poverty that they're in, that's going to dominate any utility losses to the native born who just don't like, who feel uncomfortable because now the poverty is not anonymous abroad, but they see relative poverty nearer them. Efficiency, well, the whole point of immigration restrictions is to stop things that would be efficient from moving across borders. The massive dollar gains tell you that it's a win there. Egalitarian, clearly if you care about the poor, this is something that you can do to help them, probably the best thing that you can do to help the world's real poor. And within that framework, it fits the Rawlsian framework of maximizing the welfare of the least well-off as well, because all of the people who are losers in the native-born country are all much better off than these least well-off people moving. The libertarian rights one. Right now, immigration restrictions prevent capitalist acts between consenting adults. You can't sell your home for someone to be a permanent resident in if they don't happen to be one of the 300 million people who are already in the United States. You can't choose to employ a foreigner. These are capitalist acts among consenting adults that should not be prohibited if we're just in rights theory. Even if you're native-centric, meaning all I care about is the welfare of the U.S., if these foreigners could gain so much by coming here, redistribute it to the people and some of it into the people in America, and the native's position on this also has to be pro-immigration. This is a case where I think we have most of your major contending moral theories all point in the same direction if you believe the cause and effect that economics is telling you on this. And the theory that that's based off is core comparative advantage, non-controversial part of economics. The resource at stake is the most productive that we have in the world, human labor and its creativity. And there are major barriers to that right now, and that's why we find these massive gains. So I think open immigration is a radical policy, but it's only radical because the status quo is radically unjust and inefficient. And we should go about changing that. Thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you all in the audience for uh, tuning in as well. And that's it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.